Nice. Wir sind live. We are live. Ah, nein. Hello everybody, welcome to today's live stream. Let me warm up a little bit with a little bit of noodling and then we are going to talk about improvisation. <laughs> talking about especially this. This won't happen to you. Welcome to today's uh, live stream or the kind of live stream thing. Oh, let me turn my camera a little bit so you can see me. The kind of live stream thing that I want to start a little bit more on this channel because of certain reasons. And I may should start with a little, um, yeah, with a little um, story that happened to me yesterday. And um, yeah, because I was invited into the live stream from awesome really great guitar player and german blues legend called thomas bluk and i was there with together my friend fabian ratzak uh, fabian ratzak is a phenomenal guitar player really really tasteful crazy good guitar player and we have together a podcast a german podcast um and on this podcast yeah we are talking about the wonderful world of music and guitar and we were invited to this live stream yesterday and there we had to jam a little bit and i did Maybe the big mistake, or on the other hand, the big inspiration for me to uh, re-watch this live stream afterwards. And there I realized, oh fuck, oh god damn it, <laughs> it does not really sound like I want it to be. Um, I My jamming, my improvising was not, not really, really, I was not really comfortable with what I've played there. And that has nothing to do with the stream, that has nothing to do with Fabian or Thomas, because both are great guys, great guitar players, the stream were really, really awesome. We talked a lot over two hours about practicing and all this kind of stuff. Um, but you, you can rewatch the stream as well if you want. Go to Blue Guitars. That's uh, the name of the channel from Thomas Bluk. And uh, yeah, there um, you can see some really not so not so relaxed, not so good sounding picking and all this kind of stuff. And I was thinking about this because I used to do a lot of improvisational kind of stuff when I studied jazz music back in the day. And I don't do improvisational jamming that much anymore because, um, yeah, do my work on YouTube, all this kind of stuff. Most of the stuff that I record here is, um, yeah, it's written down before 
I start to do a YouTube video and then I have 200, 300 takes uh, before I get that final take down um, for the, uh, the YouTube video in the end. And um, yeah, so this is why I thought, man, I have to regain my improvisational chops a little bit and have to work on it so I'm not that kind of nervous anymore and I know that I can sound better in these kind of situation because I used to do, do this uh, stuff a lot more. Um, and I was thinking about, okay, why not taking you with me on this journey on learning how to improvise again and working on my improvisational skills again. Uh, I was thinking about this a lot uh, through the last year about what can I do about improvisation on this channel. To make videos about this like the regu uh, regular YouTube videos is not that easy to be honest. So I was thinking about yeah why not doing it like a live stream. Um, and I don't have the, the big setup like all the friends of mine who are doing live streams professionally or Skeller, Thomas Blug, all these kind of guys. Um, but on the other hand, I thought, okay, I could wait now, get all the gears done to have the best audio and video quality, or I just cut, I just could start, you know, and I'm the, man, just start kind of person. So today we want to talk about improvisation on these kind of live streams. You want to talk a little bit about improvisation. So I always, uh, I also want to take the time to answer some Q and A's and all these kind of stuff if you have any questions, but most of it is focused on improvisation. My kind of um, my kind of way how I would practice improvisational skills and all this kind of stuff. And today we want to talk a little bit. Okay, how about how can we start? How can we start to work on our improvisational skills? Um, and <laughs> before we start. I realized that little Ingvi has, my cat Ingvi has it ha his head inside of my trash can. Ingvi, Ingvi, stop that please. Come here. Say hello to everybody, my little friend. You know how to improvise really well. And I hope everything will work technically and I hope everything will work with these kind of guys. I have two of them and they sometimes can be a little bit annoying. So I hope they won't be too annoying in the stream. All right. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit, okay, how do we start? And this is a really interesting question I get asked a lot from people. Um, like, how do you start working on improvisational skills? The problem is there are way too many uh, subjects where you could start working, practicing on your improvisational skills. Um, so I made like a little mind map. I want to share it right now to you before I have to get Ingwi away from me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I have created a little mind map and I want to do this a little bit interactive. And Ingwi, could you please go out of the picture? Thank you very much. <laughs> Ingwi always wants to be center of attention. Um, okay. So if you have any questions, and uh, or whatnot, then feel free to ask. And we just, it's just a little experiment how all these kind of live stream things will work. I think I'm going to do it like for one hour. And yeah, the mind map that I told you about. Let me, let me get this one up here real quickly because I'm also new to this program here called OBS. So here it is. I make this a little bit bigger now mind map let's let's work on this a little bit together with the chat together i i will explain a little bit my thoughts about this one in the middle is a good improvisation and i was asking myself what makes a good improvisation and then i tried to um break down all of these in three kind of categor categories like what do you need for a good improvisation you need certain vocabulary you need certain sound and you need certain chops especially from the genre where we are coming from the rock metal shred genre and first let us collect a little bit together okay what what we <coughs> i'm sorry what uh, we could have as uh, other subjects underneath those three main topics and now when we're talking about chops for example i always try to um, divide my chops into for example the basic shred technique 
I hope you can read this everything well. If I, if I should make this a little bit bigger, then just let me know in the comments. And um, yeah, what would you guys guess what the basic shred techniques are? Um, I, I start with it because it's a little bit obvious because I'm one of these shred guys and this kind of topic is really important for me and for my basic uh, practicing routine. Um, so yeah. This is the thing where I'm most familiar with. And I would say for the basic track technique, we have three kind of um, subjects that are part of the basic track techniques. I see basic track techniques in tapping. No, no, sorry. And I took the wrong one right in the beginning. Um, legato playing, sweep picking and picking, alternate picking. These are for me <coughs> the three the three shred basic shred techniques and um, now you could my ask okay are they really so important is this necessary for good improvisation no not at all I mean all of these kind of things from the mind map together make a good improvisation and there are certain players who are focusing more on the one thing there are certain situations that focusing more on the other thing and this is totally fine you have to know what your kind of thing is. This is really important. What is your thing? And for me, as you might know, I like technical guitar playing and especially those techniques are for important for me. For example, somebody was asking or was, was commenting under my last video, like uh, speed picking is the worst technique that you can teach or nobody needs sweep picking and whatnot, all this kind of stuff. And I think like, no, every, every kind of technique can be really important. Maybe not for you, but for different kind of people. And this is a philosophy I always try to, to share. Like technique makes a lot of fun. Technique is important to express maybe yourself at music, certain techniques. Um, and just not to do a technique because you are too lazy to practice it is for me not personally the way because maybe those kind of techniques um, can help you to express yourself. Okay, so let me get back to the mind map. But first of all, I'm going, I'm going to take a look into the chat and see who is up there. Uh, <laughs> I hope I will get everything organized with the interaction with the chat and talking about my topics. All kind of new for me, but quite, quite, um, yeah, exciting. So, hey Alex, hey Thomas, Sonja is there, Sonja, see you tomorrow. Um, Floyd Guitar is there, uh, Siegfried, Jonas, Gabo, Little Sponge Font, praise the sun, yes, praise the sun. My Dark Souls tattoos, uh, some uh, Karelian, I don't know, asking 200 to 300 takes, hey, of course it's over exaggerating, <laughs> but um, the most stuff, and I try to be as transparent as possible on my YouTube channel is, um, <laughs> the most stuff that you see on my channel is definitely not first take, definitely not, no, no. Um, so, uh, who we have? The Suffocator. Oh, that's such a great YouTube channel from The Suffocator. Go check it out if you are a fan of thrash and death metal. Markus, grüß dich Markus. Hi, and King Lord. Um, okay, so let me get back to my mind map that I have here uh, before I'm going to answer some questions. Um, there we go, back to the mind map. So I'm going to uh, make here, then I hit this kind, this kind of thing. And then, yes, the three techniques that I mentioned was picking, especially alternate picking. Then we have, I will do this now here, sweeping and legato playing. Again, these are for me the, the cruel, crucial, oh, that was the wrong button, sorry. Uh, let me get this one back again. So here, this one, and whatever I said, legato. These are for me the three shred techniques, but <coughs> these are not the only techniques that you need, that you have for uh, good improvisation. Again, technique is such a personal thing. Some people like more the legato kind of stuff. Some people like more the picking kind of stuff. It's, it's really personal. But what a lot of people are forgetting when it comes to technique is that 
Mm, phrasing technique also exists and this is also really important for me so like for example here I would take this and call this phrasing and what kind of techniques do we have for phrasing and there I would say we have especially the vibrato technique we have uh, the bending technique and we have Voila, way up here, hello. We have dynamic coming, dynamics coming from your playing. Um, there's a different kind of dynamics as well, which comes a little bit more from the sound aspect, from your gear, but you could also, of course, um, um, control your phrasing with dynamics and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so these are my kind of phrasing techniques that I would... I would uh, call them like this dynamic vibrato and bending, which are also really important. Then we have, of course, stuff like sliding and much more. If you know some, or if you if I'm missing something, then just let me know in the chat. And then another technique that I want to mention, whoop, that was wrong, is I, oh wait, I have to do it like this. And then duck, and then I have to push, push this button and make this blue. There we go. It's timing. Timing is another really important technique as well. Um, these are chops, and I um, divide it like this. These are chops that you are practicing a little bit differently than uh, the other chops, like vocabulary and sound, for example. And you see already there, already, already when we're trying to organize our improvisation and what we want to learn with improvisation into the only the chops kind of thing we have one two three four five six seven eight nine kind of techniques that we could practice on and that we can spend years of years of practicing so um, there I would recommend to um, trying to find a certain technique which really fits your kind of style and your playing and what you like like for example what do you like the most from listening to do you love listening to Tom Quayle and Alan Hellsworth and have the uh, really fluent legato? Do you love to listen to Frank Gambale, Alex Hutchings? Those kind of playings which have incredible sweep chops. <clears throat> Do you listen more to Paul Gilbert, Martin Miller, Andy Wood? Those kind of guys which have an incredible picking kind of chops. And what's more, a little bit more your favorite makes easier for you to get access to this kind of technique and to yeah have the fire to burn for it practicing this kind of technique years for years for years for years one of my big problems in the beginning especially was that i was a fan from all the techniques i want to learn all of them but this cost a lot of time and especially a lot of focus so i here i extremely recommend take your time with a certain technique take your focus develop a certain control over this technique and then continue to the next technique because control is the important kind of uh, phrase or kind of word the buzzword here um, in my german podcast that i have together with fabian ratzak my good guitar player friend we once invited martin miller our good friend martin miller to this podcast and there we made a, um, a episode about improvisation and he there said that for him it's really important to have the musical control that everything is kind of a decision that he makes and nothing happened by an accident everything has a purpose that he's trying to play there and to get this kind of control we that's only one thing that we can do practicing 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 so this is kind of the first mistake i would say that a lot of people are doing when they're trying to get inside of improvisation is that they are turning on a backing track and that they start to jam over it and no this is not really not really a good way to work on your improvisation to work on your improvisation the way to go is to focus on a specific thing specific kind of topic technique and whatnot and then um, try to get this control of this kind of technique or the kind of scale knowledge or whatever you want to practice right now. And so that you have so much control that you can play it without thinking about this. We want to reach that level where we don't have to think about what we are doing here. And it becomes second nature. And this is really important, but we only can acquire this by really focusing by practicing on it. All right. 
so much for that. Let's check out a little bit the chat because a lot of people are writing here. <sighs> hey, okay. Um, okay, uh, yes, Sonia was writing that it's really important or really a lot of fun to... Um, to improvise a jam with other people. And this was something that was a lot of fun yesterday as well, where we had the situation of three guitar players jamming together in a live stream. First of all, the live stream situation is kind of weird because I am now looking into a camera and I don't have any audience in front of me. Well, I could hang up some poster behind my monitor here where people are, yay, screaming and cheering for me, um, but I don't have a real audience. And so much is different from the feeling when you have an audience in front of you because you know how they are going to react to what you are doing. And you instantly know oh, they are not liking it. I like this one here, the music police, or they are really, really enjoying it. And this kind of instant um, instant reaction that you can see there is really, really important to kind of feel well. And doing this with a live stream, kind of quite, quite weird. But together with these two other great guitar players yesterday was such a great experience and we had such sometimes really great moments where somebody was playing a motif and then the other one was trying to harmonize it and we really connect and we really have a really good conversation, a musical conversation together. That was pretty cool. And then I started to try to uh, speed pick again and that was not so cool. All right. <laughs> Uh, Marcus, I'm fine. How are you? King Lord, I know as a complete guitar, you need to be good at very technique. It's a precondition. Do you... So, I mean, I love this kind of romantic idea of somebody, a guitar player, who is good in every technique. But when you discover a certain level, or when you reach a certain level in, uh, as a technique, you sometimes realize that your idols, and this is... Not easy to say much much sometimes, sorry when I switch to German here and there. Um, it's not easy to say sometimes that, yeah, you, you, you realize that your idols are not that good in the technique that you thought they were that good. Um, and where do we have kind of guitar players that are really extremely good in all technique? Um, I, every, every great guitar player has a certain amount of chops and certain techniques, but every guitar player has a favorite, especially the good guitar players have a favorite kind of technique. And this is important because the focus on this kind of one technique, it's the thing that stood out for them. Um, Frank Gambali, Sweetmaster, Alan Holdsworth, Legato Master, still both a really awesome guitar player, but Alan Holdsworth could never play a Paul Gilbert solo. Uh, Paul Gilbert could, uh, Certainly, of course, when they're practicing it for years and years and years, blah, 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 yeah, they, of course, could do it, but uh, Paul Gilbert would not be able currently to play a Frank and Bali sweep or whatnot. You know, it's easy. Uh, I, I try to, to simplify it a little bit, but think about should every should, should you really be good in every technique as a, as a good guitar player? I would say no, not necessarily, because you don't have that time in your hand and all, all that time in your life to uh, be perfect on every technique. It's kind of nearly impossible. Or oh, maybe it is. Maybe I think it's impossible, but maybe let's see in 10, 15 years what the kids out there are doing, and uh, yeah, then they prove me wrong. Uh, <laughs> hello from the Philippines. Hi. Um, Playing fast and does. Uh, we are from. Okay, somebody was uh, a little bit asking about focal dystonia. This is the thing about Christian. I'm not the expert in it. Um, all right. Just going through the chat real quickly, going through all your comments. Chris Osanova, hi Tobias. Thank you for a nice word about the then of sweet picking. Um, <laughs> so Marcus was asking something bigger here. Justin, 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 name me Justin. Uh, how do you approach practicing fast to get to the feeling for playing fast in terms of finding the right tempo for improving rather than learning wrong mechanics? Where's the threshold for you? That's a really specific question when it comes to technique. Um, and I will try to answer it as quickly as simple and as quickly as possible but I would say don't be af don't be too much afraid of um, a certain tempo and don't be af 
too much afraid to um, get bad habits in your playing. Have respect for them. Be aware of what you are doing. Always try to um, reflect your playing in terms of recording yourself or filming yourself. All this kind of stuff is important. But don't think, oh man, I have done this wrong for all these years. I could never do it right. No, that's not so true. There is, There are ways out of bad habits. It can cost a lot of time. It will cost a lot of practicing. And this is the most important thing. It will cost a lot of focus and patience. Is sticking to one technique to one exercise for six months can be really annoying but it's so worth it and uh, i know six months six months for example sounds a lot in the beginning but compare these six months to the 20 years that we are playing or whatnot you know then six months is like nothing uh, okay so one last quick question that i want to continue with improvisation and my idea behind this video here. Um, what was it like audition for Eternity's End? I, I really didn't audition. <laughs> I was chosen by legend shred lord Christian Munzner. Um, no, I knew Christian since 2019 because we did an interview here on this channel and um, yeah, Christian saw some playing of mine and he really liked it. And uh, that, to be honest, the playing is not so important. Um, especially when you are a professional musician. One thing I realized after being more and more professional after studying music is that how you play guitar is really not that important. To have a fucking degree on your wall that says that, yeah, you can play jazz, you can play giant steps, something else, is really not important. The most, one of the most important things is First of all, of course, you have to be reliable, you have to be on point and all this kind of stuff. But the most important thing is just don't be an asshole. Be a nice guy because people want to work with you together. And some certain guitar skills, um, they you could you can practice on them, you can work on them, of course playing and you turn this end you need some certain guitar skills but um, when it comes to these kind of skills there are other guitar players here in Germany who are on the same level like me or even better um, but I guess why Christian chose me as the second guitar player is just we came along so good we are good friends now and this is kind of really important because imagine when you are on tour with a band you can have the best guitar player the greatest shredder on earth there but when he is like a huge diva and a big asshole this all of this doesn't matter anymore and this is so important for the business it's yeah you you need to have some certain jobs you have to do your homework um but more important is actually that yeah just be a nice guy don't be an asshole this is so much important. <sighs> All right. <clears throat> okay. Improvisation. So, um, how should I, or how, what is my vision on, imp, uh, on working on my improvisation? First of all, open a can of energy drink. This is always really important. Mm. Oh, I'm sadly addicted to this shit. Really hard addicted. Um, okay. So, um, what I like to do, what I learned, for example, from guitar players like um, Martin Miller, is that um, you can work with the backing track, but you have to have an awareness of what you are doing and always being focused. For example, that when you are playing something, that you uh, not just play it and then go on with a different kind of idea and different kind of motif, but when you reached an idea and when you got an idea you really liked, then stick with that idea and see what you can build up out of those ideas. For example, I was jamming a little bit before we started the, the live stream. I, was, I will go back to the uh, backing track that I had there. It's a really cool backing track from Elevated Jam Tracks and B minor, actually in B Dorian. Then I came across this idea. I turned on the, the uh, camera quickly. Um, 
And then I start to think, okay, why should I play this kind of idea now and then move on to the next idea? Or let me stop here for that moment. Let me take a deeper look in this kind of idea and let me try to figure out what I can do out of this idea. So for example, here in this idea, what did I do here? Something like this in B minor, playing the B minor arpeggio or the B minor power chord first up to the ninth. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> Um, and then playing around with the minor third and resolving to a chord note, which is really important. Always try to resolve to a chord note, there you don't make a lot of things wrong. So, but now I could change some things here. For example, uh, I could play it like this, adding the ninth here instead of playing it like this. I could change the last note or where the last note is leading to. I could try to play it an octave below. Sorry. I could try to play it in a different kind of position. I could try to play it with a different chord or maybe as a, something that is called a chord substitute for example which could work really really fine is instead of B minor playing this one with D major oh, sorry something like this that I can change from So the point here, so what I want, what I'm trying to tell you is uh, that you should try to get a sense of sticking to an idea, sticking to a motive and try to develop these kind of motives and trying to get, not to be that motive like that one single moment that happens in that jam and you never get picked up again. But yeah, when you really like this kind of motive, work with it. Try to get it more and more under your finger and try to remember it then the next time when you are playing a different kind of jam and you're trying to play it in a different kind of uh, key or whatnot. Because vocabulary is also really important when it comes to improvisation and we have vocabulary as well uh, here, not here, uh, sorry, here in our mind map and vocabulary, vocabulary comes through a lot of things so we can work on our vocabulary through a lot of things. Um, so you have to see improvisation and music there a lot like in language. And how do we learn a language as a baby? We try to speak after what our parents are doing. And when you want to get into improvisation, I often, um, I often, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? They're talking about language. Um, gift, uh, try to say it differently, give, to, give a tip like uh, recommend, recommend is the word that I was looking for. Um, I often recommend people to to play along with kind of solos that you like in the certain kind of genre. Uh, try to transcribe something. These are the first baby steps from us like learning a language, trying to speak after those people. This is something that Guthrie Govan did a lot. Guthrie Govan wants I don't know if it was in one of his books or in an interview, he talked um, that he just turned on a blues song that he liked, a hard rock song that he liked, and he just played along with it. This was his kind of practicing. And these, this is a good method to yeah, create baby steps, learning a language, learning a new language. And therefore, I always recommend as well to listen to a certain genre if you want to get into a genre which is new for you. For example, when I start to learn jazz, I was not the big jazz fan. Sadly, not at all. My love for jazz comes way later when I was studying it, but during my preparation time to get uh, accepted in the university, um, I really have to force myself through jazz, but what really helped me was listening a lot to jazz, really understanding the music, musically wise. Um, and when people are asking me, ah, how can I play faster? I want to get more into fast music and they never heard Racer X before. They never heard Ingvi before, something like this. Then of course I get them 
etudes and lessons and links to learn but most important i said to them listen to fast music listen to the stuff how it should sound in the end or how maybe you want to sound it in the end this is really really important mm. all right so much uh, shortly about vocabulary okay see you tomorrow sonia bye bye uh, oh somebody have an important question Will you attend John Petrucci's Guitar Universe 4.0 in Florida this year? I don't know yet. <laughs> I was thinking about this because a good friend of mine is going. But me, I'm not sure yet. Mm, the problem is um, I have a really stupid kind of allergy. It's called EPP disease and I can't stay really long in the sun. Um, this is the reason why I, as a teenager, more was sitting in my practice cave and was practicing guitar than instead of being outside at the swimming pool or at some baseball courts or whatnot or basketball playing basketball with people with friends i didn't do this because i i'm not allowed to be longer in the sun than maybe two or three hours and being in florida in, the, in august or whatnot may not be the best idea for me but i'm thinking about this all right so, and then another thing that I like to do when um, I start improvising or I start to work on my improvisation again is I take the backing track, make it on again. The same thing that I recommend to you when you have, for example, an idea that you liked, you should also do it with an idea that you don't like. For example, I'm playing along, I'm just playing along and maybe I will get to the point where I realized, oh, that idea did not work, I want to work on this again. For example, I would stop now here and would see, okay, that line that I tried to play in the end was not really how I wanted to be, what, what was not really my intention, how it should be. Um, so first of all, I played one wrong note. I played the minor six and not the major six, this note and not this note, not the G sharp. And I wanted to do some kind of legato stuff. So I would stop here and I would analyze what did I've done here. Okay, I played wrong, wrong, one wrong note. The timing was a little bit off. How can I do it better? I'm really analyzing the line I want to play, maybe my target note where I want to go to with that kind of line. Like this, for example. And more and more yeah, getting an awareness of what I've just did here. Like when you're doing a mistake in real life, be aware of that you have done in mistakes, as excuse yourself, say, okay, sorry, I've done wrong here, and then try how to fix it. The same for improvisation. Playing, improvising is just like real life, you know? Hmm. All right, so this was something, for example. Let me continue a little bit. And here, what was the problem? The bending note was absolutely not accurate. I want to hit that note. So as soon as I realized something like this, I would immediately stop the backing track, would check out, okay, what was my problem here? Okay, I missed the wrong note. Okay, getting my muscle memory back into remembering how should I bend that note, working on this kind of issue and so on and so on and so on. So these are two, for me, really important tips that help me to get more and more into improvising. You can not just turn on a backing track and just play over it and hope that miraculously your improvising will get better. No, have this kind of awareness and have to focus on what you're doing and stop when you like something, work it out and stop when you don't like something and work this one out as well. Um, Okay, 
Okay, here's something that I want to uh, go into it. Uh, one uh, comment from the chat. Wrong notes can be a start of a really good idea. Yes, but I would go away from thinking in wrong notes or right notes. Maybe the term wrong note was not that kind of right, which I just used in this kind of lick. Go think in tensions and in releases. And, and, and yeah, and yeah, <laughs> these are the two things that I meant. Um, sometimes a wrong note, wrong note, which does not appear in the scale, have a certain tension. Sometimes this tension is really good, but you have to be aware where this, if this tension is needed right now. In the lick that I was playing, this tension was not really good because I already had a lot of tension through a fast lick. Um, Playing something fast creates a lot of energy and creates some certain amount of tension itself, by itself. Um, and then adding wrong notes here and there, you may not hear it first time or you may not recognize it if you don't know it. But I would say subconsciously, um, when you would compare the same lick with the notes that are in scale, then you would like it even more because you have way too much, yeah, adding wrong notes to a fast lick you get tension on top of tension and this can create like something that is not good for the ear for the listener for the music that you are doing so this is a whole topic i could do a whole video about this um where we should ask ourselves okay when should we use some certain tension what can create tension and i'm totally with you by not only focusing on playing the right notes of a scale but i would add to yeah again have an awareness of what you're doing for example what always works fine is the kind of uh, marty friedman trick that note here it's not in the in the scale but i resolve it and can create some interesting, some uh, more kind of spicy lines to it. This is also a reason why I recommend to, um, when you're working on your vocabulary, don't work too much on scales. Scales for me personally are important when I play fast things because it's important for my muscle memory. But when I play melodically or really more focusing on individual notes and not on that swell, that cascade of notes that we have when we're playing fast, both of, the, both of them are equally good. There's no, this fast playing is better, slow playing is better. No, I don't want this on this channel. Both is good. Um, um, but what important what was the thing that I wanted to tell you? Oh, wait a second. Um, I totally forgot what I, what I wanted to, what I wanted to tell you. Wait a second. Brain fart. Ah. Um, um. Yeah, scales. Ah, that's the thing. When I play something fast, I um, think in scales, but melodically I think in intervals. And the reason why I do this is because it's important for me to know the tension of every interval. And I will make this really, really shortly here. Um, when you have the, the intervals that have the least amount of tension that kind of always works are the chord notes. So um, when, for example, here in this backing track, we have changing chords, but the chord changes the form is so quickly that you could see everything as a B minor instead of the part where it goes to the E major there, you should focus on the E major because of the major things there. So um, when I play this, Notes that always works are the one from B minor. Oops, play the nine there. But it 
gets kind of boring because we don't have any tension and this is why I accidentally <laughs> played the nines here and there because I'm so used to, I'm not really used to only play the chord notes, but it's a really good exercise. Just try to sometimes play the chord notes to get the feeling for it. But anyways, these are the notes where you don't make something wrong with it. It's, it works all the time. Um, because you have the least amount of tension and then you can build it up like this. So you have then the fourths, the fifths, the pentatonic. This is why we always start with the pentatonic because in the pentatonic we have not really a tension side of it. Then with the second and with the six, we're getting the next level of tension in our intervals. And then with all the alterations in it, flat five, flat nine, major 13, minor 13, whatnot, depending on the situations, you get different kind of tension. What I'm not the biggest fan of is thinking a lot of things or what I just don't do and what I personally would not recommend is seeing a lot of things in different kind of scale. Like I would not practice this kind of scale. Oh, sorry, like... And would say, oh, this is the Japanese kind of scale or not. I would not recommend to do it. I personally don't do it. I would rather see it in, okay, I have the nines, I have the minus six in it, and then it's easier for me to adapt this kind of thing into my improvisation and all the stuff that I play around it. And I don't have to think like, oh, I'm in the pentatonic, and now in the Japanese pentatonic, and whatnot. Uh, it's the same thing with the so-called bebop scale. Where so the bebop scale is actually made to make grammatical enclosures for the right notes and whatnot. So this is something where I recommend to yeah have a focus on intervals. For me, it was absolutely mind blowing and uh, absolutely really really one of the greatest lessons that I got is just to focus on intervals. It, it pushed my level immediately to the next. It pushed my guitar playing immediately to the next level. Ha! All right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so much for wrong notes. Okay. Um, let me check some more comments and then I want to continue with the kind of topic that we have here in the first kind of video from this live stream because I've planned a few things here and there that I also want to do. Uh, okay. Somebody is asking us uh, about getting rid of shaking hands when performing, and um, I don't. I don't think that I have the one solution now. Um, it, making music can also always be kind of frightened, and I'm always kind of nervous when I have a big audience or whatnot. It it gets cooler for you definitely, and it gets easier for you the more you are doing this playing live. But can these kind of situations, fuck hell, I'm nervous as hell right now. <laughs> because this is also new for me and I'm not really experienced in this. And um, so every time when you have something like unexperienced like this, then you are of course nervous. It gets away the often, more often you are doing it. But I would recommend from the mistakes I made because I have done a lot of these competitions and I have played a lot of really difficult songs in front of an audience even if I wasn't not that good or not that prepared yet to play these songs, is when you have a section where you know, okay, I will probably going to fuck it up. Uh, I when I'm playing it nine times this section, I only get it two times right. Maybe change a little bit of this section. Maybe make it a little bit easier. So it won't happen that you're playing the section, then you get out of this, or you you start to to play wrong notes, and then you stop playing and you get so nervous that you can't continue with the rest of the song. So make it a little bit more easier for you. And yeah, just, just played a lot. I remember myself when I was 15 years old, we have a festival here in my hometown, which is funnily was called Rock in the Park, but it was not the rock and park that we have here in Germany. It was much smaller and it was close to getting sued by that company because we have used the same name here. And when I was 15, I was playing some solo songs there and I always I also was playing uh, Damage Control from John Petrucci and one one cover as well, but I can't remember right now. There's actually a YouTube video where from that gig, but I think I put it on offline. Maybe I should re-upload it. 
wouldn't be that bad. Well, anyways, but I've practiced this song so much standing up at home in front of the mirror, practicing my moves, practicing my performance. This is always so important for me and was a really good experience to know, hey, it is also important to practice your performance. Practice moving around while playing. Practice, I don't know, distracting yourself while playing. Practice, I don't know, <laughs> practice solos blindfolded like I did before one uh, of the Mega Life uh, sets. Mega Life, my Mega Distribute band, um, and all this kind of stuff. <sighs> all right. Um, so, okay. All right. Um, let's continue a little bit with what I've planned for today's lesson because we're going close to finishing this. Um, I want, because I want to improve, I not only want to show you how you sh could improve or what my opinion is, how you could improve, I want to improve as well. Because yeah, sometimes you have that feeling I'm telling like a lot of people on the world how they should play guitar and sometimes I feel like I can't even do it by myself and this is not really good, so I want to prove, improve. And uh, the challenge I want to set for me for this kind of thing is, um, speaking about vocabulary, that well, first of all, I want to uh, create a lick for next week, which I'm practicing next week and trying to get in my improvisation next week, like a little challenge, but I'm going to show you the lick next week when I'm going to do this kind of live stream again. And the other thing is I'm going to do a, um, a little survey here. Let me do this here. Um, because speaking about vocabulary, and speaking about learning the style from other guitar players, this is also really important and also really important to create your own kind of style. For me, my philosophy behind creating your own kind of style is like to have that melting pot of a lot of styles. And I want to, yeah, yesterday when I was jamming uh, with all the three other guitar players, I got to a situation where I kind of felt stuck and I was playing all the same licks again because I, I played all the same lick that I'm practicing currently and I, I felt a little bit too much inside of one box and I want to explore more of the beautiful music around me. So, through the, through the fact that I'm playing in a mega distributed band, I will try to um, get a little bit more into the style of three certain lead guitar players from Megadeth. And I want to, or my goal, my challenge here is now to learn a style till next week and try to get this kind of style a little bit more in my improvisation. And I'm going to do a survey now here in the chat and you can click on that and you can decide which kind of guitar player style I should kind of try to um, involve into my uh, solo improvising guitar playing. So, uh, let me do it very quickly. And then I will try to do this kind of every time when I'm doing this live stream that my audience here can decide. Uh, okay, I guess should do this kind of style, this kind of style. It's it's not going to be Megadeth all the time. It's just now fitting for me. Um, but next time you can recommend me something like, hey, Justin, would be cool when you were trying to uh, check out this kind of style or it would be interesting to see a combination out of, I don't know, BB King would play Jason Richardson licks, all this kind of stuff. Um, so, and the three guitar players that I'm going to choose from Megadeth that you can choose now eh, are these three here. So, which guitar player style should you still learn? Chris Poland style, the Marty Friedman style, or the Kiko Lorero style? I hope everything will work with this kind of survey. You can click on that and I will try to get some licks under my hands and my fingers and the specific kind of style into my improvisation which is, oh, hello, Ingvi. Um, of course, quite <laughs> impossible to do it in one week, but I will try to do my best to uh, give this kind of challenge uh, kind of a thing. So, let's wait a little bit. I will jam, I will continue jamming a little bit, and I want to make another challenge for myself while jamming, and during my jam time here, you can all click on this kind of survey, because another thing that I want to do is, the subject with the sound and this is kind of my big nemesis because I 
I don't have so much clue about pedals and amps, but I want to learn more about this. And I want to try to control more of my playing with a different kind of sound. Um, and I realized that yesterday again, I was not so happy with my sound. I was using my camper and I realized maybe the camper is not the best amp for this kind of jam situation for, for metal productions. Definitely the, one of the best things that you can have, but for the jam situations, I was not so happy. Um, oh, and therefore I now going to do something. Um, I need a randomizer. I will show this right now to you. Wait a second. Um, I know that Google has one. Uh, no. Or was randomizer the wrong word? Where's the Google kind of thing? Um, ah, it doesn't matter. I make it differently. Um, type me in a number from 1 to 100 and the first number that gets into my chat I will take and then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with this kind of number. <laughs> because I was not so prepared. <laughs> Let me have a zip of my energy again. So anybody, just type me a number from one, ah fifteen. Okay, let's take fifteen. All right, fifteen. And what I now, what I'm going to now do now is, I let me try to show you my uh, window. Wait a second. Oop, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I need my Reaper. Is this one? Yeah, that's correct. I'm using as my main tool for doing my sounds, the, um, yeah, as you can see, the archetype John Petrucci kind of thing. And I will now go to whatever the sound, sound 15 is, and I will try to improvise with this kind of sound. So I have no clue what awaits me. I have no clue if this is a high gain sound or if this is a low gain sound with a lot of effect. But my challenge here is to Get along with this kind of sound and don't get too distracted with a different kind of sound settings, you know? Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. And determines clean. Really with a lot of bass, really with a lot of delay, but that doesn't matter. We are going back to my backing track and then I will let me do it like this i will stop this um live stream now by playing a little bit jamming a little bit about the backing track maybe a different backing track to get a different kind of key and just to have a lot of fun here and i just want to say thank you for everybody who was watching this kind of first live stream if you liked it then yeah leave a like leave a comment leave a subscribe and whatnot and then i hope i'm going to see you in my next video and next week i will try to do it next thursday coming up with some licks that I will prepare for that, that I want to practice till then to get it into my improvisation. And coming up with the style of, let's see what the service says, Kiko Lorero. All right, I will try to check out a little bit more of Kiko Lorero's kind of style and what I can do to um, yeah, clone his kind of style into my improvisation. So. Thank you for watching. Let's jam a little bit. Let's have a little bit of fun here. And then I hope I'm going to see you soon. If you have any questions, feel free to write me on Instagram or other social media platforms. And yes, where's my backing track? Wait a second. Here's my backing track. All right, let's take a different one. We are taking a backing track, a deep rock ballad guitar backing track. No, that's again in B minor. That's also in B minor. That's also in B minor. Oh man, oh, D, D minor. Cinematic rock ballad guitar backing track jam in D minor. Let's do it. Oh, but first we have advertising. 
And here I just want to take the time to recommend everybody to check out the Zen of Speed Picking and the Zen of Sweet Picking, my online masterclasses of the beautiful world of speed picking and sweet picking, blah, blah, blah. When I, while YouTube can do uh, ads, I can do ads as well in my live stream. <laughs> um, and I want to, rec to, to encourage everybody to not install an ad blocker because those kind of ads can be really crucial for small businesses like I have. All right, so the second ad is uh, over pretty soon and then we can start jamming a little bit with the Andy Timmons clean sound from the Arctic Petrucci. We are in D minor, D minor. Turn the camera here down real quickly. I gain a little bit, but it's uh, fine, that's a challenge. Hopala. everybody for watching yeah as again see you in my next stream see you in my next video thank you for all the support cheers stay progress bye bye and now how do I end the stream <laughs>